Good afternoon. I'm going to share with you some insight into the life of suffering. Romans 8, 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Corinthians 4, 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. James 1, 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because heaven stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. In Luke 14, 27, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. The list goes on and on. The Bible is filled with the trials of suffering and what is promised to those who accept their suffering. Suffering has been around since before the time of Christ, thousands of years old. Yet still today, we have no answer for why is there suffering in the world? Why do some people have strokes and are paralyzed on one side of their body? Why do some women struggle with an alcoholic husband who is emotionally abusive? Why do some people develop Alzheimer's and lose their memory of their family and loved ones? Why do some children have physical deformities that keep them from fitting in with the other children? Why does a five-year-old develop bone cancer? These questions are ageless, timeless, but still unanswered. For some, the suffering in this world is a source of difficulty and an objection to the Christian faith. Before we move forward, I think that it is necessary to differentiate between pain and suffering. Pain is hitting your head on a cabinet, cutting your finger with a knife, the ache in your chest and heart when you learn your husband had a heart attack, or the frantic gasping for air because you cannot breathe because you just learned your child was killed in an automobile accident. Pain, it's real, it hurts, and it can be unbearable. Suffering is what you do with this pain. Suffering is in your mind. There are two levels of suffering. The first is when you offer it up. You take your feelings and emotions from the pain and you don't dwell on them or complain. Instead, you take your suffering and give it up to God for someone or something else. You take your suffering and bear it without complaint for a sick person, the people in purgator, purgatory, or world's peace. Your suffering becomes about others or other things instead of about you bearing the suffering. The second level of suffering is when you take your emotional grief and unite your suffering with Christ on the cross. This is a way to share in the suffering of his crucifixion, to lessen his pain, and to complete his redemption. Personally, I have only experienced the first level of suffering, when I offer it up for someone or something else. The closest time I come to the second level of suffering is when I say the stations of the cross. But I am oftentimes an outsider looking in, I never truly unite myself with Jesus and his suffering on the cross. To me, this is the most selfless and loving form of suffering. You are basically concentrating your entire self on Jesus. You and your suffering become a small glimmer to the suffering of the one you are connecting with, our Savior. I could try to stand here and offer guesses on why there is suffering in the world, but to be honest, I am just as baffled as you. But instead of using the unknown to separate me from my faith, I choose to use it to bring me closer to my faith. A popular atheist comedian of today has stated, if I ever met God, this is what I would say to him. Bone cancer in children what is that about? How dare you create a world where there is such misery that is not even our fault? It is not right. It is utterly, utterly evil. While 
Those are some strong words. But unfortunately, there are many others that question the same thing. And for many, it distances them from their faith. They want an answer to this. But since we cannot answer one of the greatest mysteries of human life in our world, they turn away. They give up. I cannot do that. I have more hope and faith in God than just turning away. In my heart, I choose to believe that God used my daughter Ashley for an important job. I do not think that her brain cancer was random. I believe that there is a purpose to her sickness and to her death. I believe that God does not make mistakes. This is all part of his plan. Being a grieving mom, I have met many others that have lost children, but not all feel the same way that I do. Each person has his or her own right to deal with their pain and suffering. It is actually part of your relationship with God. Why my child? Why brain cancer? Why so early in life? Why such a terrible, debilitating disease? Trust is the basis of faith. We don't have the answers. I choose to trust that I will one day know why my beautiful, healthy, happy 16-year-old daughter got a disease that caused her own suffering, not being able to speak, not being able to walk, and in the end, the loss of her beautiful smile. Every day, I have to remind myself that there is a greater good. I just need to trust. Bishop Barron explained this very scenario in one of the most comforting basic ways. Imagine that the three volumes of the popular book series, Lord of the Rings, are ripped to shreds and cast into the wind. The pieces of the books float in the wind for months, becoming worn and tattered. Someone who has never read Lord of the Rings picks up a small piece of paper that has a few sentences on it. The sentences tell of the characters Frodo and Sam at the depths of their suffering. To anyone who reads these sentences, they would think, what an awful book. Only a monster could write such a horrible book, and who would ever want to read it? But unbeknownst to the person holding that small, tattered piece of paper, those sentences are part of a paragraph, that are part of a page, that are part of a chapter, that belongs to a book, and that book belongs to a wonderful series that tells a beautiful and amazing story. You cannot only look at that one piece and form a judgment. You need all of the information, and unfortunately, we do not have that. Our faith instructs us to believe that we are part of a greater good, a greater plan, that no matter what trials come our way, will lead us to the eternal glory that far outweighs them. However, there is a beauty in suffering that I did not expect to experience. Since the death of my beautiful, precious daughter, I am a better person. I am more of the disciple that God asked of me not because of fear, but because I firmly believe that if I live the life that God has intended for me, and I live it to the best of my ability, I will be rewarded with his kingdom and the beautiful promise of living together forever in eternity. Pretty amazing, right? I want that. I want that so bad that I am constantly striving to be closer to God loving to others, and make the world a better place. I try to live every day to reach my goal, heaven. The suffering is what you do with the pain. Will you turn your back on Jesus? Will you deny the existence of him? Because if he is so good, then why is there such bad in the world? We don't have the answers. But in my suffering, it is like I see the world through a pair of tinted glasses. The world is a different place. The world has pain, the world has suffering, 
but the world has so much good. Because of my pain and suffering, I am able to identify the good so quickly. I am able to appreciate the beauty, cherish it, and thank God for it. Yes, my pain and suffering are still there. It will always be there because of the endless love I have for my daughter. However, through it all, the good shines. I see it. I feel it. I am thankful for it. Sitting down at a holiday dinner and knowing that my daughter was tremendously loved by each and every person in that room. Walking through the park with your husband, kids, and parents on a beautiful vacation. Driving with friends and pulling over on the road to catch snowflakes in your mouth and make tiny snowballs. Dancing in the kitchen with your husband and feeling so safe and loved in his arms and knowing that life is going to be okay. Your youngest son climbing into bed with you and watching Caribbean life as his hand lightly touches your arm. Your daughter dancing with you at a party and smiling and laughing. Your oldest son seeing that you are quiet, putting his arm around you and not letting go. And of course, the ultimate good. Beyond all of life's suffering, the promise that we will share eternal life in our Father's kingdom. So, there is suffering. However, there is also beauty in the suffering. You just need to open your eyes and your heart to see it. God bless you during this Advent season, and thank you for letting me share this with you.